Hello everyone, this is Rob Orson with the Emerging Civil War and the Prince William County Historic Preservation Division. We are here right now on one of the prettiest spots in Northern Virginia, Matthews Hill at the Manassas National Battlefield Park. Over my right shoulder, you can see, probably, hopefully you can see in the distance, uh, that's Henry Hill with the Park Visitor Center there in the far distance and the very iconic Stonewall Jackson uh, statue to the, to the left of that. So Matthews Hill is, to me, is, uh, is a very important spot in Civil War history because um, up to this point, if you study the American Civil War, a lot of the small skirmishes leading up to this point, a lot of the fighting in Congress, the fighting in the newspapers, a lot of it's rhetoric. Um, but here on this hill, as John Hennessy would uh, title his great book on First Manassas, The End of Innocence, here on Matthews Hill is the end of innocence. Here you have two armies, one from the north, one from the south, standing up to each other, not yelling, not fighting with words, but fighting with guns and bayonets. Here, brother versus brother begins. Here, states from people, uh, soldiers from South Carolina, Louisiana, Georgia, against men from Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and New York will square off here and lead to begin what's going to be four years of serious bloodshed um, across the American continent. So for me, this is a special place to visit every year on July 21st because to me, this is where the Civil War really begins in earnest. And it's also a very pretty place. Um, Professor uh, Pete Carmichael will say battlefields today are kind of uh, misleading. They're very peaceful and, and bucolic places. Uh, this place here is very pretty. We're in the middle of Northern Virginia. There's a busy highway off to my left. You may be able to hear it, but you probably can't see it. Down below, off to the right, is one of the busiest intersections in this region, Route 29 and Route 234. If you come here in a couple hours in the afternoon, tons of traffic. But right now, it's all hidden by this beautiful battlefield. But let's not forget here in the morning of July 21st, this was anything but a beautiful place. This is a place where men were dying. This is a place where families back home, missing loved ones, would lose loved ones. So this is not a place at that point in time that would have been something that you could have enjoyed as we're enjoying today. Um, one last thing I'll mention before I turn over to my colleague, Kevin Pollock. The battlefield here has been in a long process of restoring the landscape, much like many of our Civil War battlefield parks have been doing. They've added fence rows here. You can barely see them over the tall grass, uh, showing where the fence lines were here in the Battle of 1861 that played a pivotal role uh, for the men from South Carolina and Louisiana who fought here and the Union troops that were coming on the tack from behind where the camera is right now. Um, off to my right and your left, you'll see a small wood lot. If you came here 15 years ago, there would not have been any trees there. The park is trying to reestablish historic wood lots here to kind of give you a better idea for how the terrain and the vegetation here affected the outcome of the battle. Uh, so if you come up here at any point in time, there's a great walking trail here. Uh, you can cover the entire action here on Matthews Hill on July 21st, but it's a very special place. To give you some more of the detailed history, we're gonna pull Kevin into the conversation here and talk a little bit why this place is important in your opinion and also what took place here in July 1861. So as Rob mentioned, it's a little quiet now, standing up here on Matthews Hill, and on July 20th of 1861, it was just as quiet in this region. Following the action at Blackburn's Ford on July 18th, there was not any significant skirmishing or action, be um, action between the two sides at all, between the two armies, as they continued to condense their positions along the banks of Bull Run. July 19th and 20th, Irvin McDowell was looking for a way to get around the Confederate left flank. His efforts to uh, punch, or at least get around the Confederate right flank, the southern flank, uh, were, were basically turned around because he couldn't get his army through the, uh, the terrain along some of those back roads, and so McDowell was looking to the north instead. So on the 19th and 20th, while much of what would become the battlefield was silent, McDowell had his cavalry and engineers out looking for a place uh, to get around the uh, Confederate left. Now in the meantime, some of his engineers and some of his staff officers and the federal soldiers gathered around Centerville could hear off in the distance what they believed were train whistles. And those were the whistles of trains, various uh, trains bringing elements of Joe Johnston's Army of the Shenandoah here to Manassas Junction to reinforce Beauregard's army posted behind Bull Run. Because of that and for other political reasons, McDowell believed that he had to move quickly. And so on the night of July 20th, 
he gathered some of his division and brigade commanders into his tent at his headquarters in Centerville, and he laid out his plan for the next morning. That plan called for feints to be made towards Blackburn's Ford and the Stone Bridge Crossing where the Warrenton Pike comes across Bull Run, and uh, McDowell would slip 13,000 men in two divisions commanded by David Hunter and Samuel Heinzelman around the Confederate left flank behind the Confederate line and begin rolling up the Confederate position further and further towards the south. The other thing that Irvin McDowell was starting to worry about and take into consideration here on the front lines along Bull Run was that Joseph Johnson's army of the Shenandoah might now be arriving. And so part of his plan for the morning of July 21st was that as those two divisions, 13,000 men, came across Bull Run and they freed up more and more Union troops to come across the stream, some of those soldiers would head west to seal off the Manassas Gap Railroad at Gainesville. This was McDowell's hope, basically, that he would be able to keep Beauregard's army and Johnson's army separated and that uh, McDowell would be able to defeat one of those armies by itself. McDowell did not believe, he did not take into consideration Johnson's army at all when figuring into this equation uh, during the campaign because he believed that Robert Pat Patterson's army and the Shenandoah Valley, his federal forces would be able to take care of Johnson's uh, command and keep it tied down in the valley. But instead, Johnston gave him uh, the slip, and most of the Confederate units that would be engaged on July 21st were actually units belonging to Joe Johnston's Army of the Shenandoah, uh, freshly arrived from the valley. For PGT Beauregard and Joseph Johnston, their plan developed also on the afternoon of July 20th. Beauregard believed that the South expected him to make an offensive against the Federal Army here in Northern Virginia, and so he planned for that. He planned for the Federals to strike his center at Mitchell's and Blackburn's Fords, and then in the meantime, while the Federals were occupied there at those two crossing points, um, Beauregard would send most of the rest of his army around the Federal left flank, just like Irvin McDowell was trying to plan for the next day, and Beauregard hoped that those Confederate forces would be able to cut off the Confederate, uh, excuse me, the Union retreat route back to Centerville, and that he would be able to destroy the Federal Army and win this one resounding victory, the single grand victory that every soldier, north or south, was looking for here uh, at the Manassas battlefield. So this has been Kevin Pollock on behalf of myself and Rob Orison from Emerging Civil War signing off, and we will see you at Henry Hill for our next stop.